Professional wrestling is beloved by millions. Sometimes the sport gets a lot of shade because many people call it fake. Yes, all the shows are scripted, but a lot of matches are entertaining despite it being fake. Just because everything is staged, that doesn't mean that dark moments don't happen because over the years, horrific moments have happened behind the scenes and even in the ring. In today's video, we're talking about wrestling's darkest moments. Welcome back to another video. Thank you for all the crazy recent support lately. It truly does mean the world to me. Make sure to follow all my social medias and go buy yourself something nice at earldoesexist.com using my link in the description below. And make sure to watch the video till the end because it does support the channel a lot and like the video if you guys like it. And please, one more thing, everybody just comment random stuff in the comments below because I really wanna get this video pushed to as many people possible, but enough blabbering and let's just get straight into this video. Ole Anderson Alan Robert Rogowski, born on September 22nd, 1942, is widely recognized by his ring name, Ole Anderson. He is a retired American professional wrestler, referee, manager, and promoter, having commenced his wrestling career in 1967 within the American Wrestling Association. As a member of the Anderson family, he played a pivotal role as a founding member of the influential wrestling stable known as the Four Horsemen. Anderson's character was a heel, meaning that he acted like a jerk because he's the bad guy in wrestling. Most of the time, heels are jerks when they're wrestling, but out of work, they're really nice people, and them being mean is just an act. Which couldn't be said the same for Ole Anderson, as he was very rude outside of work. One time, Anderson would call a booker the n-word and would call other black wrestlers the n-word to their faces despite knowing their names in the first place. Ole Anderson was a bad man, and allegedly, Ole hired a hitman to legitimately kill Gerald and Jack Briscoe, though this never came to fruition. I don't know if this is 100% true or if this is a wrestling storyline, but articles say that this was legit. On another occasion, the Road Warriors told the brothers that Ole had offered a bounty to whoever could break the brother's limbs in the ring. Given Ole Anderson is a huge jerk, it should come as no surprise that someone was eventually going to try to hurt him. In the book, Inside Out, How Corporate America Destroyed Professional Wrestling, Anderson detailed one such instance. When a wrestler working for him asked for a time off due to the death of his grandmother, Anderson very sensitively asked him if he was going to resurrect a dead family member or if he wanted to work. Several other wrestlers, including Stan Hansen, watched this man pull out a gun and aim it at the back of Ole's head. But nobody warned Ole because they wanted to see if he would actually shoot him. That's how much the locker room hated Ole Anderson. Clearly, he wasn't shot, and Ole Anderson is still alive today. So, where is the man that pulled the gun on Ole Anderson? Well, I don't know. There really isn't much on the story other than Ole briefly mentioning it in a book. Even though Ole Anderson is a huge jerk, this was a very dark moment that happened to him and he should be thankful that the wrestler didn't shoot him because that would make the story even darker. Mick Foley Michael Francis Foley is an American professional wrestler and author. He is currently signed to WWE under the company's Legends program, acting as a company ambassador. Mick Foley is one of the most respected wrestlers of all time for being an extreme daredevil. Mick Foley is also known for his iconic iconic characters such as Dude Love, Cactus Jack, and the iconic Mankind. One of the most infamous moments in professional wrestling is WWE's Brawl for All tournament in 1998. The idea was to have real fights among wrestlers alongside the usual scripted matches, but it didn't go too well. Mick Foley, a WWE Hall of Famer, talked about the tournament's impact on Dr. Death Steve Williams. The plan was to make Dr. Death a new star, but he unexpectedly got knocked out by Bart Gunn. Foley was there with Williams in the dressing room. Williams hurt his knee during the knockout, and dealing with knee problems was already tough for wrestlers. Recovering physically was easier than emotionally for Williams. Foley described it as one of the saddest nights of his life. Seeing someone he knew would never be the same again. Mick, of course, was very sympathetic towards his friend, but he too had some bumps in the ring. Arguably, one of the most iconic bumps of all time. On June 28th, 1998, at the King of the Ring pay-per-view, Mankind, aka Mick Foley, had a match with The Undertaker inside of Hell in a Cell. The match took place on top of the 16-foot cage where Undertaker would push Mick Foley off the cage, causing him to crash land onto a table. 
That night, Mick fully suffered a dislocated shoulder, a dislocated jaw, a concussion, bruised ribs, internal bleeding, numerous puncture wounds from the thumbtacks, knocked out at least one tooth into the nostril. Fun fact, till this day, Mick Foley still has that tooth stuck up his nose. One of the most gruesome incidents in Mick Foley's wrestling career took place during WCW European Tour in 1994, specifically in Munich, Germany. While performing as Cactus Jack, Foley had a match against the late Big Van Vader, leading to a horrific injury where his ear fell off. Bro, you can't even see my ear. <laughs> On March 16, 1994, during the tour in Germany, Cactus Jack and Big Van Vader had a match that became infamous in pro wrestling history. Due to Vader's arm injury, Cactus Jack took on more of the wrestling responsibilities. In the course of the match, he attempted the hangman move, not realizing that the ring ropes, which are made out of elevator cables wrapped in rubber casing, were unusually tight. As a result, Cactus Jack's neck got legitimately caught. Causing extreme discomfort, he was on the verge of passing out. Describing the terrifying experience in his memoir, Have a Nice Day, Foley said, I felt like I was going to die right there in the sport halla in Munich. In this state of distress, Foley screamed for help, fearing potential damage to his carotid arteries, which could have led to brain damage or even death. Eventually freeing himself, Cactus Jack found his ears split and bleeding. Upon re-entering the ring, he continued the match with Vader, who grabbed Cactus's right ear and ripped it off during the exchange. The match persisted as the referee picked up the severed ear, handing it over to the ring announcer. Foley underwent a 4-hour operation, during which all the cartilage from the missing ear was removed and replaced in a man-made pocket above his remaining lobe. This procedure aimed to keep the cartilage vital for potential reconstructive surgery in the future, as revealed by Foley in his book. Hulk Hogan News Segment Richard Belzer, a comedian and the host of Hot Properties in 1985, found himself in a memorable incident during an episode where he was interviewing Hulk Hogan and Mr. T about their upcoming WWF WrestleMania 1 tag team match. Belzer, curious about wrestling holds, asked Hogan to demonstrate a move on him on live TV. Hogan applied a front chin lock, causing Belzer to pass out and carelessly hit his head on the floor as he slipped from Hogan's grasp, causing his head to split open. Belzer, upon waking, cut to a commercial break and later received 9 stitches for the head injury at the hospital. In the aftermath, Hogan apologized on air, expressing surprise at Belzer's lack of physical training, and cautioned viewers against attempting wrestling moves without proper training. Belzer returned to Hot Properties a week later, displaying the stitches from the incident. He subsequently filed a 5 million personal injury lawsuit against Hogan, leading to a scheduled court hearing in the New York Supreme Court. However, Belzer and Hogan opted for an out-of-court settlement with undisclosed terms. Remarkably, Belzer used the settlement funds to purchase a home in France, which he whimsically named it Shay Hogan. Owen Hart Owen James Hart was a Canadian professional wrestler who worked on several promotions including Stampede Wrestling, New Japan Pro Wrestling, World Championship Wrestling, and the World Wrestling Federation. He received most of his success in the WWF where he wrestled under both his own name and the ring name The Blue Blazer. In 1999, The Blue Blazer would have a gimmick where he descended from the rafters to the ring using a harness. Despite having success performed this stunt multiple times, a tragic incident occurred on May 23rd, 1999, during the Over the Edge pay-per-view event. On this occasion, Owen was set to execute this entrance stunt without the use of guide wires. As Owen prepared to make his descent, the harness gave way under his full weight, resulting in a fatal fall. In response to the immediate tragedy, the WWF swiftly displayed a pre-recorded promo on screen, shielding the live audience and viewers at home from witnessing the distressing event. Although footage of the incident exists in the WWE archives, it has never been released to the public. Only audio recordings and photographs capturing the unfortunate incident have surfaced online. The decision by WWF management was to proceed with the event after Owen Hart's tragic death caused considerable controversy. Jim Ross later informed home viewers of Hart's passing during the pay-per-view, but the live audience in the arena remained unaware. The event, marked by this unfortunate incident, 
was never commercially released by WWF Home Video. In 2014, 15 years after Hart's death, the WWE Network aired the event for the first time, accompanied by a small photo tribute acknowledging Hart's demise. During the original broadcast, all footage featuring Hart was carefully edited out. The statement reads, In memory of Owen Hart, May 7th, 1965 to May 23rd, 1999, who accidentally passed away during this broadcast. In the years following Hart's death, attention was drawn to the harness he used that night, particularly focusing on the quick release trigger and safety latches. The Hart family took legal action against WWF four weeks after the event citing the dangerous and poorly planned stunt and alleging defects in the harness system. After a year and a half into the case, a settlement was reached on November 2nd, 2000 with WWF agreeing to pay the Hart family $18 million. The manufacturer of the harness system, also initially named in the lawsuit, was dismissed from the case after the settlement. Martha Hart, Owen's widow, used a significant portion of the settlement to establish the Owen Hart Foundation. In 2002, Martha authored a book titled Broken Hearts, The Life and Death of Owen Hart. In a DVD set, Bret Hart expressed regret that he wasn't with the WWF on the night of Owen's accident, as he believed he could have dissuaded his brother from attempting the dangerous stunt. Chris Benoit Christopher Michael Benoit, a Canadian professional wrestler, had a prolific 22-year career in various wrestling promotions, notably the WWF and WWE, WCW, ECW, and JPW, and Stampede Wrestling in Canada. Known by the nicknames The Canadian Crippler and The Rabid Wolverine, Benoit achieved significant success, holding 30 championships across different promotions. He was a two-time world champion with a reign as WCW World Heavyweight Champion and another as World Heavyweight Champion in WWE. Tragically, on June 24, 2007, Benoit was scheduled to win his third world championship at a WWE event, but over a three-day period, he committed double murder and suicide. He murdered his wife on June 22nd, his 7-year-old son on June 23rd, and subsequently took his own. Research by the Sports Legacy Institute, now known as the Concussion Legacy Foundation, indicated that depression and CTE resulting from concussions in Benoit's wrestling career were likely contributing factors to his crimes. Benoit's legacy in professional wrestling has sparked extensive debate due to the heinous nature of his actions, despite his exceptional exceptional technique wrestling ability, the discussion revolves around the tragic event surrounding his personal life. Renowned combat sports journalist Dave Meltzer acknowledged Benoit as one of the all-time greats in pro wrestling history. Benoit's induction into the Stampede Wrestling Hall of Fame and the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame faced reconsideration in 2008, but readers opted to retain his membership. Benoit's upbringing in Montreal and later Edmonton, where he idolized wrestlers like Dynamite Kid and Bret Hart, influenced his wrestling style. Trained in the Hart family dungeon, Benoit adopted a high-risk wrestling style reminiscent of Dynamite Kid and later incorporated Bret Hart's finishing move, the Sharpshooter. The tragic events unfolded when WWE, concerned about Benoit's absence from scheduled events, requested a welfare check. Police discovered the bodies of Benoit, his wife Nancy, and their son Daniel. WWE canceled a live Raw show, replacing it with a three-hour tribute to Benoit's life and career. Toxicology reports revealed that Benoit, Nancy, and Daniel had various drugs in their systems, with no indication of roid rage contributing to the violent behavior. Benoit had previously received medication not compliant with WWE's talent wellness program in 2006. Following the double murder suicide, Neuroscientist Christopher Nowinski suggested that years of brain trauma might have influenced Benoit's actions. Tests on Benoit's brain revealed severe damage, consistent with an advanced form of dementia, potentially linked to repeated concussions. In response to the revelations, WWE removed almost all mentions of Chris Benoit from their programs, broadcasts, and publications. Rest in peace to the victims. And that is the end of Wrestling's Darkest Moments. Thank you guys for watching this video from beginning to end. It truly does mean a lot to me. And don't forget to check me out on my other social medias for more behind the scenes. Thank you for all the crazy support and I'll see you guys in my next video. See you guys.